Chapter 1 In the Beginning In the year 4004 BC at precisely 9 o'clock on the morning of October 23rd, quote, God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them, end quote. The year, the day and the hour of the creation unspecified in the Bible itself were calculated by two 17th century scholars after a painstaking chronological study of the Old Testament. Testament. And most of their contemporaries accustomed to regarding the Bible as the literal truth welcomed the information. To be able to put a date to the creation gave it a comforting actuality. After another 200 years were to pass before the new science of the Victorians began to chip away at the edges of the scriptural illusion. Then in 1859, Charles Darwin published The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, a synthesis of ideas long discussed within the scientific community, but almost unknown to the general public. It was concerned with plants and animals, not man but its logic was inescapable. There had been no single act of creation. Man, like others of the world species, had developed from some lower form of life. The descent of man in 1871 identified this lower form of life as a hairy quad, quadru, quadruminous animal. That's Q-U-A-D-U-R-U-M-A-N-O-U-S. Quadruminous animal belonging to the great anthropoid group an ape, in fact. The wife of the Bishop of Worcester is said to have exclaimed, Let us hope it is not true, but if it is, let us pray that it does not become generally known. History does not re record whether it occurred to her to ask what kind of ape. Does it matter? Perhaps, unsurprisingly, the answer is that in the history of relationships between the sexes, the question of whether humanity's direct ancestor, Ramapithecus, more closely resembled the gibbon, the, chimp the chimpanzee or the gorilla, is by no means irrelevant. Darwin himself could not have answered it. His work on evolution was hampered by the fact that, although the distinction between nature and nurture, heredity and environment was already being made, the existence and roles of genes and hormones were not to be substantiated until the early 1900s, more than 20 years after his death. Nor was there yet any fossil record of early man or any reliable analytical study of animal behaviour. In the century since The Descent of Man was published, generations of biologists, zoologists and anthropologists have filled gaps of which Darwin was scarcely even aware but the story of human origins remains vague and much of what is known is still highly speculative. Broadly, the current view of the transition from ape to man is that between 20 million and 14 million years ago, the descendants of a true ape diverged along three different branches of the family tree. One group evolved into the ancestors of gorillas, chimpanzees and orangutans, another into a large ground ape not unlike the baboon that roamed Asia for an indeterminate period before becoming extinct, and the third into man's direct ancestor, Ramapithecus. Over the course of another few million years, Ramapithecus gave up life in the trees for life on the ground and began to eat meat as well as fruit and vegetables. This supplied them with extra protein, which, if human history may be adduced as evidence, probably speeded up his evolution quite consider considerably. The last 5,000 years have shown that peoples with a high protein intake are usually more dynamic than vegetarians, and Ramapithecus needed to be dynamic, for he was now competing for his food. The only thing that really mattered to him with the great sleek hunting cats that ruled the grasslands. Ultimately, he discovered that two feet and two hands, one of which could be used for hurling missiles at his enemies, were a good deal more useful than just four feet, and the result was a changeover to what is inelegant, inelegantly known as bipedal locomotion. In evolutionary terms, this proved a catalyst 
rather than a conclusion, but among its direct, if long-term, results were the Venus de Milo, the Kama Sutra, Miss World and the Joy of Sex. What a vertical posture did for humanity was force it to reconsider the traditional mating positions of the primates and later to assess beauty from a different viewpoint.